Just two lost souls swimming in a fishbowl year after year, running over the same old ground, and how we found the same old fears. Wish you. I'm all about that bass, about that bass, no trouble. I'm all about that bass, about that bass, no trouble. I'm all about that bass, about that bass. Now it's pretty clear, I ain't no size two, but I can shake it, shake it, like I'm supposed to do. I got that boom, boom that all the boys chase, and all the right tunes in all the right places. I see the magazine working at Photoshop. We know that stuff ain't real. Come on now, make it stop. If you got beauty, beauty, just raise them up. Every inch of you is perfect from the bottom to the top. Yes, my mama, she told me don't worry about your size. Because boys like a little more booty to hold it nice. You know I won't be no stick figure, silicone bar. Hold it. 
Said the nation army couldn't hold me back. They're gonna risk it all. They can let the time right behind my back. And I'm talking to myself at night because I can't forget. Oh, back and forth through my mind. Cigarette. Hey, I'm 
Co, 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 co? Co, co, co? Co, co, co?
Ladies and gentlemen, please take your seats. We're just about to begin. Thank you. to all of you for joining us this morning. Um, many friends in the audience, thank you. Um, it's really a, really a great honor and a pleasure uh, to be able to welcome uh, Senator Bob Menendez here with us today. Um, talk about transatlantic relations in a changing world. And uh, I think you'll agree that uh, it not only is the world changing and rather challenging, but transatlantic relations have been a bit challenging recently too. So uh, there's a great deal to talk about. Let me also mention uh, how, we del how delighted we are to have uh, Ambassadors Sondland and Gidwitz uh, with us here today as well. We're delighted always to work with the, all three U.S. missions here in Brussels, so thanks for being with us. Um, our, our mission at GMF is very simply uh, to strengthen transatlantic relations, and we're looking forward to the uh, discussion today, to the Senator's remarks, uh, to our debate. Um, let me just say, uh, many of you, of course, will know Senator Menendez, but just to say he served in Congress for 27 years, uh, first in the House and then in the Senate since 2006. He was chairman of the Senate Foreign Relations Committee from 2013 to 2015, and since then he has been the ranking member or the senior most Democrat uh, on the committee. Uh, so a very important person in our system and, uh, and a very important visitor to Brussels to talk about these uh, issues. Uh, just a word on how we're going to organize this this morning. Uh, we will have the Senator's remarks and then afterwards we're going to sit down for a bit of a conversation here and then open it up uh, to all of you for question and answer. So uh, again, Senator Menendez, thank you for being with us. The floor is yours. Thank you. Well, Ian, thank you for that kind introduction. I'm honored to be here at the German Marshall Fund, a key pillar of the transatlantic relationship, a manifestation of historical commitment that binds our continents, and your power of convocation combined with sensible policy recommendations for those on both sides of the Atlantic have made GMF a truly indispensable organization. So thank you for your leadership and the efforts of your incredibly fine staff. I want to recognize our ambassadors. Uh, we're thrilled that with your very busy uh, schedules that you've taken time to be here, Ambassador Sondland uh, and Ambassador Gidwitz, thank you very much for, for joining us. We meet here today on the fifth anniversary of the start of Ukraine's revolution of dignity. The courage sown by the Ukrainian people during those uncertain days is a true testament to the Ukrainian spirit and a simple but powerful desire for true independence and sovereignty. In the weeks that followed February 18th of 2014, Russia would begin its illegal occupation of Crimea and invasion of Eastern Ukraine. On this anniversary, I want to express my solidarity with the Ukrainian people as this conflict grinds into its sixth year. May it be the last. We also meet this morning at a time when the transatlantic relationship is under serious strain. We can point to specific actions from the Trump administration, its decision to withdraw from the Paris Climate Accords, its imposition of steel tariffs, but more fundamentally, its downgrading of long-held universal values of democracy and human rights, of the importance of these shared values in driving our strategic partnership, or having dealt serious blows to the relationship with our friends in Europe. I come before you as a strong advocate and supporter of the transatlantic relationship which truly has served as the basis for so much progress across the globe since the end of World War II. This relationship has served as the basis for peace, the basis for growth and prosperity. American presidents have consistently looked to European capitals over the decades and joined forces to accomplish great things. And leaders across the continent have been able to rely on those in the Oval Office. If we think of that, period of time, the fall of the Berlin Wall, the Paris Climate Accords, diplomatic efforts to counter common adversaries like Russia, Iran, North Korea, responding to the challenge of a rising China, 
building democratic institutions and advancing human rights abroad. Simply put, the United States is stronger, safer, and more prosperous when we work in concert with our friends and allies in Europe. The German Marshall Fund itself is a tribute to what America and European partners together we criticize multilateralism as if it were an ideological end unto itself. As if the multilateral institutions the United States and our European partners spent over half a century building were not born of common values or shared challenges. As if we lived in a world where countries and our citizens exist in isolation. That, of course, belies history and reality. Working with our allies and partners is the most durable way to ensure that we meet and sustain mutual goals of peace, security, and prosperity for all of our citizens, that we build and support institutions that respect and build upon those shared values. Now, do we always see eye to eyes? Of course not. But as democratic societies founded with a respect for freedom of thought and speech, we recognize that differences of opinion are only natural. That's why we build multilateral institutions that empower us to work out the difference and find common ground. That's how we achieve such historic progress over the last 70 years. And that's how the United States and Europe will counter the threats and seize the opportunities that await us in this century. So instead of attacking our friends in Europe, as President Trump has done, we should redouble our efforts to find areas of common ground and common interest. In a world where we need to work together to face real threats, I for one humbly believe that the United States should lecture less and lead more. Lecture less and lead more. Now what do I mean by lead more? Instead of diminishing support for democracy, devaluing human rights, and disregarding long-held freedoms of the press and expression, we should be expanding space for civil society fortifying our commitment to universal human rights and advancing journalistic freedom at home and abroad. Instead of attacking regional and international institutions, we should be working constructively to ensure that they are responsive to the concerns of our people and resilient enough to grapple with new challenges. Instead of imposing tariffs on China, we should lead an international effort at the World Trade Organization to make Beijing abide by its international trade commitments. Instead of simply calling for energy diversification in Europe, we should more proactively encourage and incentivize the private sector, as well as involve countries to finalize projects like the Eastern Mediterranean Pipeline. Instead of precipitously withdrawing from Syria and abandoning those that fought alongside us, we should finish the job of eradicating ISIS from the region and call upon our allies to bear part of that burden. That are examples, my friends, of what I mean by leading with allies, not lecturing. My friends, efforts such as those shouldn't be dismissed as some kind of idealistic pipe dream. I'm not advocating that we naively see the world only as we would like it to be. I'm calling on us to strengthen our multilateral institutions out of a recognition that in the 21st century, insularity is a dead end. The answer to the challenges we face cannot be reflexive nationalism and nativism. These sentiments nearly tore both my own nation and this continent apart for over centuries, and they can do it again. That's why giving them a platform and amplification is so dangerous and reckless. It's time we get back to the fundamentals. Instead of brazenly attacking long-standing institutions that have served to keep the peace since 1945, we must ask ourselves, what can we do to restore and reform their central pillars? What can we do to strengthen the transatlantic bond? I have a few ideas. First, I believe change begins at home. We must defend our alliances by making it clear to our people exactly what is at stake. Nothing short of peace, prosperity, and democracy itself. We must call out political parties and leaders who stoke hatred and division and instead strive for a political discourse that appeals to the highest hopes of our citizens rather than their worst fears and instincts. Of course, this is about more than rhetoric. 
We cannot ignore conditions at home that serve as breeding grounds for various strains of populism and nationalism. Economic insecurity, displacement from globalization and technological change, the shrinking of wages, the concentration of wealth. Throughout history, autocratic leaders have taken advantage of these anxieties. As democratic leaders, we must address its root causes. Second, like-minded public servants on both sides of the Atlantic must renew efforts to support the democratic process, civil society, and human rights abroad. Repressive corners of the world have grown even darker in recent years as dictators and despots find themselves subject to less scrutiny from the United States and others in the international community. Many of our friends and partners in Europe have come to expect that the United States would be a steadfast partner in supporting these values of democracy and human rights, that we would unequivocally stand on the side of real freedom, of good representative and respectful governance. As someone who has been a champion of these values over nearly three decades in the House of Representatives in the United States Senate, I was saddened to see that the venerable organization Freedom House downgraded the United States in its annual survey of political rights and civil liberties in 2018. We cannot champion these values abroad without a strong democratic foundation at home. While this administration has not prioritized support for democracy and human rights, we must not lose heart and we must not lose focus. And we must not become unmoored from the principles articulated in the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and the 1975 Helsinki Accords. These fundamental principles matter now more than ever. And I want to be clear and unequivocal. On this issue, the administration does not speak for and does not represent all Americans, or even most Americans. Third, we must consistently act in support of NATO. That means that all political leaders in the United States, including the president, should never waver from a robust and rock solid commitment to the alliance. But it also means that each member of state must spend 2% of GDP on defense in line with commitments made at the 2015 Wales Summit. Fourth, and in a more practical sense, the dialogue between the United States and Europe at all levels must deepen. Every bond requires nurturing, and that cannot only be the work of government officials. We need engagement not just between heads of states, but also from legislature to legislature, political party to political party, civil society to civil society, business to business, and citizens to citizen. There are countless areas where we share common ground, but today I'd like to just highlight three countries where our common efforts could significantly contribute to peace and stability. Those countries are Iran, Russia, and China. First, Iran. I understand that there is broad opposition in Europe to the administration's decision to withdraw from the JCPOA. And while I did not support the JCPOA when it came up for a vote in Congress because the agreement delayed, it did not end Iran's pathway to a nuclear weapon, I was concerned that the administration did not have a comprehensive strategy to deal with Iran when it pulled out of the deal, one that should have included our allies here in Europe. And while we may disagree about the best pathway forward to confront Iran's nuclear ambitions, we should be able to agree that we must confront Iran's destabilizing behavior across the Middle East, its ballistic missile program, its funding and support of terrorism, its violation of human rights. I appreciate that Iran's support for terrorism presents a more acute threat across Europe. Its destabilizing actions across the Middle East have a much more significant reverberation here on this continent. For example, the IRGC's support for Assad fueled the war in Syria, sparking the worst migration crisis in Europe since World War II. Hundreds of thousands are dead in Syria as a result. Millions have been displaced, causing a serious migration crisis in Europe, one that Russia is only too quick to capitalize on. Hezbollah's power to inflict terror across the region has grown exponentially. The Iranian government is complicit in some of the most egregious human rights violations in the world, most notably against its own people. According to nearly every independent human rights advocacy organization, the Iranian government continues to crack down on freedoms of expression and association, jailing hundreds of journalists, students, writers, 
and average people who took to the streets to protest the gross mismanagement of the Iranian economy. Iran has detained American dual nationals on spurious charges. But as you all know, of course, their ambitions extend well into this continent. I believe the EU's decision to sanction members of Iranian intelligence who were responsible for the assassination of two Dutch nationals in 2015 and 2017 was an important step. France has rightly called out plots to bomb a rally of Iranian opposition members in October of last year. And Albania recently took important steps in expelling Russian diplomats for their ties to foil, excuse me, Iranian dis diplomats for their ties to foil terror plots. And the list goes on. Iran continues to violate UN arms embargoes, putting weapons into the hands of terrorists and rogue actors across the Middle East. Iran's ballistic missile program should remain an enormous concern for the world, especially here in Europe, given the range of those deadly weapons. Iran's leaders continue to publicly insist they will test missiles beyond the current 2,000 kilometer limit, missiles that could hit continental Europe. We know that, we know that Iran's Sajal missile is capable of hitting EU member states in southeastern Europe. Germany, the United Kingdom, and France said that the missiles launched by Iran into Syria on October 1st of last year were reportedly, quote, inherently capable of delivering nuclear weapons. As we all know, UN Security Council 2231 called upon Iran not to undertake these activities. And this month's attempted space launch by Iran is just another wake-up call for all of us. So we know that Iran's nuclear program is ultimately the central threat, but ignoring more conventional threats to our security could come at a great cost, one that we should not be willing to pay. We can, we must, continue working together to confront Iran's destabilizing activities. Second, the United States and our European allies must do more to robustly counter aggression by the Russian Federation. Make no mistake, I was heartened to see overwhelming international solidarity in the response to the Skripal attack in the United Kingdom. And I hope this will serve as a basis for renewed solidarity in addressing Kremlin aggression across the board. I've continued to press the Trump administration to work with our European partners to re-energize our common front against Kremlin aggression. Russia's attack in the Kursk Strait was nearly three months ago, three months ago, yet there's been no significant international response. Every time Putin's actions go unanswered, I fear that we set the stage for more aggression, more attacks. As we meet here today, 24 Ukrainian solar, sailors remain in a Russian jail with no end in sight. That's simply unacceptable. Russia's aggression also continues in eastern Ukraine. As we speak, the Kremlin is working to destabilize Ukrainian politics in advance of next month's presidential elections and Russian influence operations and malign efforts could destabilize upcoming European Parliament elections this year. I think we all understand the threat, but instead of moving forward with robust joint responses to Kremlin aggression, the US and Europe are unfortunately spending more time and energy cleaning up messes after high-level summits and presidential visits. With no real transatlantic strategy in place, we remain flat-footed while President Putin charges ahead. Last week, Senator Lindsey Graham and I introduced legislation that would strategically position the United States to better counter Kremlin aggression. The Defending America Security from Kremlin Aggression Act, or DASCA as it's known, would improve our ability to coordinate with Europe on the Russia challenge, invest in democratic institutions in countries most vulnerable to Kremlin aggression, and increased transparency with respect to real estate sales in the United States that we know is a go-to strategy for oligarchs looking to launder money. This bill also includes provisions that would increase sanctions pressure on Russia. The bill increases sanctions on Russian oligarchs complicit in the spread of Russian malign actions and includes measures that would increase sanctions on Russia's energy and financial sectors in response to Russian interference in democracies and continued aggression in Ukraine. The bill has specific sanctions on the Russian shipbuilding sector to the extent that Russia continues to interfere with freedom of navigation in the Kursk Strait or elsewhere, and on those complicit in the November attack at the Sea of Azov. 
We have seen President Trump question the NATO alliance both publicly and privately over the past two years. And we know that destroying the transatlantic alliance remains at the top of Putin's wish list. Our bill also includes an important provision that would prevent any president from pulling the United States out of, Senate, out of NATO without Senate approval. A Senate vote was required to get us into the North Atlantic Treaty. It should also be required on any attempt to get us out. President Trump has made clear his skepticism of NATO, a sentiment the Senate has strongly and in a bipartisan way unanimously rejected on several occasions over the past year. NATO is the strongest military alliance in the history of the world, and it should remain so. I know that there are different views in Europe as to whether new sanctions should be imposed on the Kremlin. I only ask that we review the facts as to whether there is a need. The attack on the 2016 US election, the use of chemical weapons in the United Kingdom, continued attacks in eastern Ukraine, aggression abroad and repression at home, support for nationalist fringe movements, support for Bashar al-Assad's bloodbath in Syria, which fueled the incredible migrant crisis here in Europe, Russian cyber attacks across Europe and interference in the French elections, the threat of interference in the upcoming European parliamentary elections, the violations of international law on the high seas with respect to the Kerch Strait, the violation of the INF Treaty, which is purely, squarely on Russia. Moscow will continue to push until it meets genuine resistance. Now, our collective sanctions measures taken to date, while commendable, have failed to change Kremlin behavior because they have not succeeded in changing the Kremlin's calculus. I believe that increased sanctions pressure should be done in coordination with Europe, and we have to take a balanced and smart approach. Increased pressure on Russia's energy sector must come alongside of a new effort to support Europe's energy diversification, such as the East Med pipeline. Increased focus on coordination with Europe must come with a new office at the State Department focused on sanctions diplomacy. Increased vigilance against Russian malign influence must come with more resources for the State Department's Global Engagement Center and the NATO-EU Hybrid Center and other non-governmental efforts in the US and Europe. I know that increased sanctions pressure is difficult in a consensus-based organization like the European Union, but the stakes are too high and the threat from the Kremlin is too great. This imperative for cooperation with Europe on sanctions is so important that we included a whole title in our bill that mandates the administration to report on diplomatic efforts to build bridges on sanction implementation. The bill establishes an office at the State Department which would solely focus on sanctions diplomacy, something that many European friends have asked for over the past two years. Let's build the infrastructure for a better dialogue on these issues, while also focusing on results and a stronger, more effective pressure track with the Kremlin. Working together, working concretely, this is what I mean by America leading, not lecturing. As a champion of the transatlantic relationship and a friend of Europe, I hope that you agree with how I've characterized the threat. And instead of allowing Moscow to drive a wedge between us, I hope we can work together in devising a credible response and deterrent. Thirdly, China. Responding to the rise of China falls squarely in the mutual interests of the United States and Europe. As China assumes a global role and the Belt and Road Initiative expands around the world, the United States and Europe must be present at the creation able to shape and set standards for the 21st century. We must actively work closely with recipient of Belt and Road countries to strengthen their ability to negotiate good terms in Chinese investment. We must make every effort to ensure that the rule of law in these developing countries is not washed away in a flood of Chinese cash. We may not be in a position to counter euro for euro, China's state-owned enterprises or checkbook as it builds infrastructure around the world. But we also don't need to be so. That's not where our competitive advantage lies. We are ideally positioned to help countries protect themselves and their people under a rules-based order by setting standards, by standing up for human rights, including labor and the environment, by supporting institutions that allow the weak to arbitrate fairly and justly with the strong, by offering technical assistance and diplomatic backing. I would add that our transatlantic China strategy must include joining forces on trade. 
China's predatory and mercantilist practices challenge both sides of the transatlantic economy. Unfortunately, the Trump administration has not made addressing these challenges easy. We spend too much time fighting over tariffs between us than working together on a, Chinese, on a China strategy that would benefit both of us. Our combined economies are a force to be reckoned with. Our best hope at negotiating fair trade practices with China and establishing the rules of the road for global commerce in this century and beyond is to work together. But as we work together in this regard, we need to carefully navigate these economic issues with China. What may seem like regular economic transactions can have serious security implications. For example, the increasing prevalence of Huawei and other Chinese technologies in the European market is of growing concern. And akin to entering into a deal with the Chinese military is your partner. By moving forward with these deals, Europe runs the risk of endangering its telecoms infrastructure for years to come. Chinese investments in ports is another example. While these ports may be commercially desirable, can they be relied upon at times of national emergency when the movement of goods of military vessels and military supplies becomes critical? As we look to address these issues, lecturing European or other allies and partners about the dangers of relying on Huawei and Chinese technology for 5G only goes so far if we do not have an alternative for that architecture. If we want to be competitive with China and not just confrontational, it needs to start with serious investments at home in the cutting edge technologies of tomorrow. Just being confrontational for the sake of being confrontational is not a good strategy. It's attitude, not policy. Being serious about the resources that it takes to compete so that we can continue to work together uh, to develop a world that reflects our values open to all, that is what successful strategy is all about. The United States and Europe have spent decades working to build a rules-based international order that supports stability, preserves peace, and advances economic opportunity for all. Yet these rules of the road are under steady assault by Iran's support for terror, a revanchist Russia, and a rising China. We face serious threats to our democratic institutions, our security, our values, and our economies. Only together will we overcome them. Looking back, the Marshall Plan showed the United States at its best. It was indeed a substantial commitment by American taxpayers. But we should not look at George Marshall's efforts in purely altruistic terms. I believe that the investment under the Marshall Plan has paid us dividends in the form of an international system that allowed democracy, economic growth, and innovation to flourish. President Trump may not understand this concept, but it has been a great return on investment. These rules of the road have kept the peace. These rules of the road embedded in our institutions have given us economic progress and provided a better life for tens of millions of our people. I'm not suggesting that the world should be frozen in amber. Yes, we need to be open to reform, refinement, and adaptability. New technologies, new challenges, the changing distribution of power around the world all suggest that we must be flexible in adopting and readapting the transatlantic order for a new era. Our transatlantic architecture and the values it represents must remain central, however, to this new era as well. The wholesale dismissal of the values and institutions that have served us so well is not only destabilizing and short-sighted, I believe it's dangerous. As I wrap up, I want to quote from George Marshall's speech to the UN General Assembly in 1948. In it, he said, and I quote, we will not compromise essential principles. We will under no circumstance barter away the rights and freedoms of other peoples. We earnestly hope that all members will find ways of contributing to the lessening of tensions and the promotion of peace with justice. The peoples of the earth are anxiously watching our efforts here. We must not disappoint them. At its core, that's the purpose of the United Nations and so many other important institutions we helped develop to keep the peace in the post-war period. And the sentiment expressed is still important today. I'm the senior Democrat on the US Senate Foreign Relations Committee, recently reelected to a six-year term. I believe in the values that I have described here today. I have many colleagues, both Democrat and Republican, who believe in these values as well. Some of them have just started six-year terms. 
These values, honed in close friendship with Europe for decades, are who we are. These values represent the best of aspirations of America. And those fundamental core principles do not change, cannot change, and will not change because of any one president. Make no mistake, our system is being challenged in ways we haven't seen in over a century. But people of good faith have a significant say in our system and in the course of events. And many have pledged to protect and defend these institutions both at home and abroad. In closing, Americans are more secure because we have friends in Europe. And Europeans are more secure because they have friends in America. Americans are more prosperous because we have friends in Europe. And Europeans are more prosperous because you have friends in America. Both Americans and Europeans will have a better future if we build upon and strengthen the transatlantic architecture constructed over the past 70 years. Our shared values, our respect for a rules-based international order, our respect for democracy and human rights, these are the fundamentals of the transatlantic partnership. They are what has changed the course of human history for the better. I stand before you as a proud transatlanticist, one who believes in the limited, limitless possibilities the United States and Europe can accomplish when we work in concert. One who believes that the strength of our leadership comes through our alliances and not simply lecturing. The path ahead may be rocky. The challenges may be great. But I believe in the people of good faith on both sides of the Atlantic who have pledged to protect and defend our democratic institutions both at home and abroad. No one else will defend our vision of peace and stability, free and fair competition, and a rules-based order. It is up to us, as transatlantic partners, only we can secure our future together. Senator Robert Kennedy famously would often say, some men see things the way they are and ask why. I dream things that never were and ask why not. As we meet here in Brussels, we should look to our common future. We should look to the possibility of a revitalized transatlantic bond we should look to a new, renewed commitment to our democratic principles, and we should ask, why not? Thank you very much for listening, and I appreciate your being here. Senator, I'm told the sound's better. Okay. Better. okay. <laughs> Senator, thank you very much indeed uh, for that very wide-ranging, you know, very comprehensive discussion of not just transatlantic relations today, but also uh, many challenges we're facing in the world. Uh, so we thank you for that. Uh, I'm also conscious of your time, of our time, and I want to make sure we have enough time for Q&A from the audience. But maybe before we get to that, if you agree, we have just a, a couple of questions, a couple of things that occurred to me as you were speaking. Um, you know, you touched on a lot of very big issues. One of the ones you touched on was the basic U.S. interest in, in the, what Americans like to call the European project. It's not often called that here, but anyway, in the EU. Um, say a word, if you would, about how you see um, the military part of that. There's a lot of talk in Europe at the moment about, you know, a European army, strategic autonomy. In essence, you know, Europe not only spending more, but doing more, in some cases, on its own, uh, for its own security. Is that in American interest? I think what's in an American interest and Europe's interest is the strengthening of NATO, which has proven itself to be the most significant security architecture uh, in nearly three quarters of a century and that has helped uh, provide for peace and stability in the world, and doing everything we can in that regard. Now, that requires we, we still, as the United States, have the overwhelming burden in terms of actual cost, in terms of what we provide. Uh, and that means that having our allies move to their committed goals is, is an important one. But everything we can do to strengthen NATO, I think, is incredibly important. We, we have new challenges. We have cyber attacks and how we deal with the question of cyber warfare. That is a new reality of this century. We have irregular forces as a new concept, 
how does NATO deal with the concept of irregular forces, for example, as what's happened in Ukraine. So from my perspective, strengthening this relationship and building upon it is the singular most important thing that both Europe and the United States can do for its mutual security. Thanks. Afghanistan. Uh, there is, I'm interested if you agree, a kind of new debate in the United States about Afghanistan after almost two decades of presence there, you know, throughout most of that period with major partnership from Europe. Um, where do you see that? Is it time to get out? And under what conditions? Well, look, uh, after 17 years of incredible shed of uh, American lives and national treasure, we would hope to get to the point that Afghanistan can be self-sustaining. But a precipitous withdrawal from Afghanistan, as a precipitous withdrawal from Syria, uh, is not in our national interest or that of the world. Uh, so I applaud the administration and its effort to uh, have a peace dialogue uh, with the Taliban. Uh, but the Taliban must prove not only that in fact, they say that they will be committed to an Afghanistan that won't be a launching part for terrorism, but they have to disassociate and sever themselves from the very ties that are the essence of terrorism in the world. They must ultimately enter into a negotiation with the Afghan government, otherwise there will be no resiliency in any such peace. It would be a brittle peace at best. So I appreciate the move in that direction, and one must be cautiously optimistic. But if we ultimately withdraw precipitously, then uh, it seems to me that all the blood and national treasure that we have shed there, and that's our allies have shed there, uh, would ultimately leave us in a vacuum uh, without the ability of the Afghans to sustain themselves in the long term. So um, as, as someone who voted against the war in Iraq, uh, and I was in the minority when I did that, but it's in the House of Representatives. I'm not someone who, uh, you know, nilly willy likes to see U.S. military engagement abroad. But there's also a reality of the ground, and that reality right now dictates that we're going to have to, from my perspective, and I think it's a bipartisan view that's been expressed in the Senate on both the question of precipitously leaving Syria and Afghanistan, that you have to have the conditions precedent necessary in order to do that. That is our aspiration, but first you have to have the condition precedent. Say just a little bit more, if you could, about uh, the U.S. and the Middle East these days. I mean, this is a perennial concern on this side of the Atlantic. Uh, there are obviously new dynamics uh, at work in the region, but also in some of our key alliance relationships, including with Egypt, with Saudi Arabia. Uh, just what are you focused on these days? Where do you see that going? Is it still as much of a priority as it was in previous years? It is. I mean, the... the, the I think the security of the world dictates it. Certainly the region dictates it. Um, and we need to constantly work to engage uh, our allies in the region and to bring others in common cause. Uh, however, having said that, I'm concerned that uh, we also need to uh, stand up for certain core principles that America has in this process. Uh, I find it uh, abhorrent uh, that we have not moved on the assassination of Jamal Khashoggi uh, and, uh, in a way that speaks even in a good relationship. One has to stand up for these principles. And so uh, as the senior Democrat on the Foreign Relations Committee with its former chairman, we invoked a provision of something called the Global Magnitsky Rule uh, Law, which allows the chairman and the ranking member to ask the administration uh, for a determination, in this case, we asked for a determination on the Crown Prince of Saudi Arabia uh, as to whether or not he was expressly involved in the murder uh, of Khashoggi. And uh, we did not get an answer. Uh, so we're going to continue to press that, uh, including legislation that we have introduced uh, in a bipartisan fashion on the, what we call the uh, uh, Saudi Arabia uh, Accountability and Yemen Act. So we have allies and we are willing definitely to work with our allies in common cause, but we also need to stand up for certain core principles, and this is one of them. Senator, in a, in a very different sort of sphere, um, there are a lot of issues that have been contentious between the United States and Europe, but on some issues we seem to be roughly on the same page, and I, I'd be interested if you would talk just for a moment about Venezuela. 
mm -hmm. for example, and where you see U.S. policy going on Venezuela and how you see the opening for cooperation with Europe? Well, I'm, I'm really pleased to see so many European countries have recognized Juan Guaido, uh, who is the legitimate interim president of Venezuela under the Venezuelan constitution, under the Venezuelan constitution. Most of Europe, as did most of the Western world, did not recognize the illegitimate election of Maduro. Uh, there is a vacancy, therefore, under the constitution of Venezuela and that is the president of the National Assembly, Juan Guaido, who is committed. I've spoken to President Guaido, and he is committed to holding elections uh, you know, as soon as possible once they are able to fully uh, move forward in terms of the national government. Uh, so uh, I'm glad to see uh, that uh, in this respect, I applaud the administration. They have led uh, on this regard. They have brought people in common cause. Uh, and I, I think it's incredibly important. It is a shame uh, that the malnutrition, the suffering, uh, the arrests, the killings that have taken place by the Maduro regime in a Latin American nation that should be one of the wealthiest and the standard of living for its people should be high uh, is what it is today. And so the world coming together in a diplomatic effort for a peaceful transition, I think is an incredibly important moment in the Western Hemisphere and for the world as well. Okay, now I wanna be sure we save some time to, to go out to all of you here, but you, you'll allow me just perhaps one final question to you directly, which is, uh, in all of this, are, is there an area where you think, or areas where you think the Trump administration has basically gotten it right? Well, just mentioned Venezuela, I think they've okay. gotten it right, uh, that's one. I think very often the administration analyzes the challenge correctly, but then doesn't have a strategic plan to actually pursue successfully meeting the challenge. And very often does not appreciate the role of allies and bringing allies together and in common cause to achieve these goals. And so I think they very often analyze the challenge as well. Look, look, China has unfair trading practices. It has forced technology transfers. It violates intellectual property rights, which we lead in, in the world, and so many other things. So it has recognized that those are challenges. How it deals with the challenge is, I'm sorry, is often the, is often, often the problem. Okay. So, please. Opened up to all of you, a few hands, I can see. <laughs> anyway, just on the aisle right here, if I could. We have a microphone, I think, that's coming around, and Brooks, go ahead. And do tell us uh, who you are and where you're from as well. Yes, Thanks. of course. Uh, Brooks Tigner, Jane's Defense Weekly. Just one question, if I may. Um, I wonder, Senator, what you think the real level of support for NATO among your younger colleagues, whether Democrat or Republican, whether S Senate or the House really is. And regardless of which president or party is in power in the future, do you see that level of support remaining stable or declining due just to the sheer passage of time mm -hmm. and generations? Thank you. So, so you're calling me old, in other words, when I'm younger. <laughs> <laughs> we're about the same age. All right. I want to know what the young. I think we're young. I personally think we're young, but we're anyway. Young, yes. <laughs> uh, look, I think that the answer to that question is best, you know, we had a new wave of elections. We have a lot of new, dynamic, younger members in the House of Representatives. There was a recent vote on the House of Representatives as related to NATO. I think if I recall correctly, the vote was over 350 in favor, uh, and the, the balance or so, about 435 opposed. Now, for those of you who have been watching American uh, uh, government and politics, it's rare for us to get 355 votes uh, on something in the House of Representatives, where I, I served in before out of 435. And so that is a foundational support that is transgenerational uh, as it relates to NATO. And I, and I find that also in the Senate. I think uh, we've had a vote recently as an expression of support of NATO. And I think, if I'm not mistaken, that might have been 98 to 2 or something like that, if, if not near unanimous. So uh, I think that, that there is a, I think the American people appreciate the importance of NATO in this relationship. So uh, I think that support is deep uh, and it's broad. Okay, right. Lady just in the front here, please. Um, 
Just right here, please. Thanks. Good morning, Senator. I'm um, Federica Faxio from the UISS. I was wondering if you could tell us more about DASCA, and uh, in particular, there's a provision that you mentioned regarding NATO and uh, a requirement for uh, two-thirds of the Senate to, to withdraw from NATO. Mm -hmm. I was wondering uh, how this uh, bill that you introduced relates to the NATO Support Act, if you could. No. So I, because there is this deep and wide support of uh, the U.S.-NATO uh, transatlantic alliance as, as manifested in NATO, uh, we believe that uh, as a clear statement to the world that uh, it, since the United States entered into NATO through ratification of the United States Senate, that regardless of who is in office at any given time, whatever the course of events are as the world unfolds in the days ahead, that a vote of the United States Senate should be necessary to withdraw from NATO. And that, I think, sends a rock-solid understanding. If you couple it with the expressions of the votes that have been taking place in the Senate and in the House in support of NATO, you understand that there not only is there two-thirds, there's far beyond two-thirds of support. So that would basically make it very clear that no one's going anywhere as it relates to NATO. The United States certainly is not. And I think that's an incredibly important uh, uh, mechanism at this point in time. And so we, th we feel that that's an important part of DASCA. Uh, and uh, there have some in the House who have sought to do that just separately and standing alone, which of course I'd ultimately support. But I think it's an important part of DASCA as well. Right. I perhaps could go just on the aisle in the back on the left. Yeah. Thanks. Thank you very much. Niklas Novaki from the Wilfrid Martin Center for European Studies. Uh, Senator Men Menendez, could you say a little bit more on what do you see as the European Union's role specifically in the transatlantic relationship? And, and I'm asking this because it seems that under the current administration, the rhetoric towards the EU has turned a little bit more negative. And we hear things such as the European Union is an adversary of the United States and that it was set up to take economic advantage of the US. So if you, if you could say a little bit more on this subject, thanks. I think there is strong support for the European Union as an institution. I think. Uh, while it was Europeans who decided to come together in common cause, I think the United States was very supportive of those efforts. Um, we will, uh, as in any bilateral or multilateral relationship, have differences. We have differences, for example, on how we deal with Iran. We need to work out to find common ground on that. We have trade differences, and all we seek as a country is f fair trade, a level playing field, uh, and uh, the, you know, we would be happy to subscribe the same standards that Europe wants to apply to us as we would apply to them. I'm not sure that they would be happy with that, but that's, that would seem to be fair. Anyhow, there are, there are challenges, but as an institution, I think there's incredibly strong support in the United States and certainly in the Congress for the EU as an institution. In fact, bringing the EU together at the end of the day is another, it certainly has enormous economic values, uh, you know, and, uh, but it also, I think, uh, brings Europe together in a way that expresses itself to core commitments to universal values that we share uh, with our uh, transatlantic partners. And I think that that's incredibly important as well. Okay, Corinna, please. Hi, my name is Corinna Hurst from the German Marshall Fund. Um, Europeans are often very puzzled about the fact that the US only has two parties, put two political parties, Republicans and Democrats. Now, since the midterm elections, very diverse, but there are also internal debates going on. Um, and I was wondering, could you comment a little bit about where you see both parties are going? On the, on the Democrat side, we have the Justice Democrats really wanting to push a bit more to the left. The Republicans, we haven't really heard anything about the Tea Party members recently. Also, there's a lot of surprise among the Europeans that the Republicans even followed President Trump to such a degree because he, he isn't really seen as a Republican. So could you 
say a bit more about where you see both parties going in the future? Thanks. Yeah. <laughs> Next question. No. <laughs> <laughs> I'm just kidding. Uh, so uh, let me talk about my own party first, because I have more expertise in that than I, than I, than I am in the other one. But look, uh, from my perspective, and if, in my remarks, you heard me say that we must confront the challenges in our respective countries that are real uh, at home if we ought to strengthen our relationship abroad. That includes the challenges of uh, this new century in terms of displacement of workers, of artificial intelligence, and how we deal with that in terms of what it will mean in the, in the, in the, in the employment field and the displacement that will take place of that. How do we deal with that intelligently? We, we have the concentration of wealth. We have inequality that uh, creates a challenge. So for my own party, uh, we have universal values. Those universal values are expressed regardless of what spectrum you are in our party uh, by a belief that government can be an agent for good, that it can help to create opportunity, uh, that it, and in creating that opportunity, regardless of the happenstance of what station in life you were born into, uh, that there is a place for it. In my own case, I am the son of refugees born in the United States, grew up poor in a tenement uh, in New Jersey, first in my family to go to college and then go to law school. If you told me that I could rise to be one of 100 United States senators in a country of 320 million people, at that part of my life, I would have said, that isn't likely. But it is the promise of America fulfilled. It is a promise we fight to keep true for future generations of Americans. So there's a lot of interest about our party supposedly moving to the left. From my perspective, we lost the last presidential elections because we did not have an economic message to middle America. So I would go around when I was campaigning for Hillary Clinton and I would say GDP growth is rising slowly, but other countries in the world were in recession or near recession. We had six years private sector job growth, all time high stock market, all time low interest rates, and a whole host of macroeconomic numbers that were very compelling. And people would come up to me after these rallies and say to me, you know, Senator, uh, that's all true, but in my life and that of my family, the son I send off to college is back at home living with me because they can't find a job. I have a loved one who I'm taking care of, and it's an enormous challenge, but I'm doing it out of absolute commitment and affection. I have postponed my retirement age because I don't see myself making ends meet at that age. And the American dream is if I work hard and play by the rules, I get ahead. Well, I'm working really hard, and I'm not getting ahead. And who's the guarantor of the dream? It's you, the government. So you guys must not be doing your job, so let me shake it up and vote for people you know, who are totally not in a traditional context. And so I believe that's in large respect why President Trump won, uh, because in his own way, he and Bernie Sanders at the time, in different ways, talking to the same segment of the American society, which I sit on the Senate Finance Committee that deals with all tax and trade policy in addition to the Foreign Relations Committee, and I had my tax guy look, because I heard this so many times, I said, where is medium income for American families in real dollar terms? And two days later, he came back and he said, they're stuck in 1999 in real dollar terms. At the time of the election in 2016, that was 17 years of stagnant income. So these, this part of America, which is the backbone of America, was feeling totally unattended to. And the president spoke to them in terms of you know, the Mexicans and the bad trade deals and all those things. Bernie Sanders talked to them about income inequality and the rigged system. But they struck a responsive chord with this part of the electorate, which is still, I think, a challenge as we move into 2020. So I hope that our party is less about going to the left or the right. I hope our party has a strong economic message that middle America sees themselves as realizing their hopes and dreams and aspirations. And if we do that, I think we will be successful in the 2020 elections. As to the Republican Party, look, my own view is that as I listen to many of my colleagues privately, and of course I will never divulge any of their names, uh, the reality is they have a different view in many cases than the president. But right now, at this moment in time, he has captured the Republican Party as his party. It is not the party that I have known and grew up with over a lifetime of public service, which was fiscally conservative and socially moderate. It's changed transformationally. And so they are afraid of standing up to him in the context of the electoral consequences they face. 
And so that's, that's a part of the dynamics going on. Mm -hmm. Senator, I'm conscious of your time. I'm also conscious of our time. Uh, and with apologies, perhaps we can take one more, and, okay. because I do want to keep you on schedule. Yep. Ambassador Vandala, please. Thank you very much for your uh, remarks, Senator. Um, I have a question which comes to mind after so many years in the United States and so many years as ambassador to NATO. You made a point which we have heard and over and over again, rightly so, about the huge difference in defense spending on the European side and the defense spending uh, on the American side. Point <coughs> well meant, point well taken. But over all these years, when I try to develop two additional arguments saying that we should bring into the equation uh, the way we have exported stability to the other half of the continent, what we are doing in Africa, for instance, uh, then I didn't have much of an audience. If I made the argument that, <clears throat> yes, we should do more together, but it would even be better if the European countries did more, but together. There again, I felt the reticence. Yes, you Europeans, you have to do more, but don't do too much together because you risk, you risk <coughs> impairing the transatlantic relationship. And uh, I would like to hear you on these types of arguments, uh, why they don't receive that much of an audience, and secondly, if by giving it an additional audience, we would create commonality, which I, as a transatlantic believer, would applaud. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Well, if I understand your question correctly, look, I, I believe we certainly should look at the totality of uh, our, our commitments abroad, both we, the United States, as, as well as uh, the EU and NATO. Uh, those are important. But if we were to add our commitments abroad outside of our military expenditure, then again, the, the number would go up dramatically. We, we, we dramatically spend, uh, as someone who's been an advocate in, in the committees for some time, on uh, international uh, economic development, on diplomacy, uh, on democratic governance issues, on rule of law issues, uh, on a whole host of ways in our uh, efforts to help people uh, in global health. Uh, I'm proud uh, of the United States leading the way uh, in meeting the challenge of AIDS globally uh, and malaria and other critical health issues. So uh, if we added that into the equation, that would also dramatically uh, create an imbalance. So I, I think we should consider the totalities, but NATO has a specific purpose. It has a specific uh, mission. And I believe that uh, our biggest deterrent against global actors, whether they be non-state actors, or now most recently the resurgence of facing state actors like a revanchist uh, Russia, comes to the strengthening of the alliance and the resources that the alliance has that makes any potential opponent understand the consequences of such an engagement. So I'm always open to considering other things, but this is the core of uh, our security architecture. It has served us well. It doesn't mean that it, that it cannot be improved upon, but it ultimately uh, has been the essence, a foundational element of peace and stability for nearly three quarters of a century. And I'd like to see us bring it now into the 21st century to meet the new challenges that we have so we can enjoy another, hopefully, century of peace and stability in the world. Senator Menendez, thank you very, very much indeed. Thank you, Ian. I appreciate it. That was a, really a fantastic, a, a fantastic conversation. Uh, you're always welcome back at GMA. We have to do another event where you come back and talk about American politics. I think there would probably be a, an audience for that uh, as well. Uh, our thanks to you again. Our thanks to your staff. Uh, it was a pleasure to work with you. Let me also uh, just say a special word of thanks to my colleagues at GMF who, who put this together, and especially uh, my colleague uh, from Washington, Rita Jo Lewis, and her congressional affairs team. Uh, this would not happen without them, so thank you, Rita Jo, uh, very much. Thanks to all of you again for being with us, and we look forward to seeing you again soon. Thank you. Great. Appreciate it.